In this episode, international man of mystery Travis Rosbach and I came up with a few sketch ideas. You uh, flew this plane through a Category 1 storm, right? Hurricane. Mm-hmm. Hurricane. Yeah, all right. Yeah, it's not a storm. It's a hurricane. All right. So I was thinking, like, how does it, how does it get crazy as it ramps up? What is the thing that, that really sets it to a Category 6? <laughs> I love that you hired a six, a six foot four felon to help you out with chopping down <laughs> trees. And you said like, found out I was faster than he was, right? But he's a six foot four felon. Now I don't know if you're 188 to 205 pounds, like you're probably a little, little bit taller than me, maybe right around the same, but I'm this like is someone you're going to be looking. Okay. So you're going to be looking up at this guy and you got to tell him, Yeah, you're not very good at this. Like, how do you have that conversation? I should know this, but Blue Dream is probably a strain of the marijuana that you like to smoke, that you go out and chop down trees. Okay, so you say that you can hear the trees talking to you. What conversations are they having with you? (laughs) <laughs> as you're chopping them down. Like, I think that that would be really interesting to find out. Hey, the trees maybe aren't so cool with this. Like, hey, go to the gym. You don't have to come out here and do this. So, <laughs> That's my cousin, man. Leave him alone. Yeah. Which one did we pick? You'll find out on this episode of... It's a sketch comedy podcast show. Welcome to Sketch Comedy Podcast Show, the one-of-a-kind show where I, Stuart Rice, invite interesting people to have intriguing conversations and then improvise a comedy sketch based on what we talked about. It's the only show like it on the internet. Travis Rosbach made his claim to fame and riches by developing the Hydro Flask. Uh, You know, the metal water bottles that high school students use and cake with stickers. But Travis is much more than the purveyor of high-end drinkware. He's also a high-flying hero, uh, an adventurer, and one that communicates with trees. On a side note, this is one of my favorite episodes I've ever recorded, and this conversation was so much fun. I hope to have Travis on again. And now, my conversation with Travis Rosbach, creator of the Hydro Flask and unironic, International Man of Mystery. Travis. Stuart. Thanks so much for joining us today. I've got a quick question for you, if you, if that's okay. As long as it's not a hard one, I'm okay with that. Well, we'll see. It, it goes in waves. What makes you interesting? Ha, huh, it is a hard one right out of the gate. Um... This morning, I was down at the Tumalo Country Store slash gas station, and I was thinking about that because I listened to your show, and um, I had to pay cash, and I realized last Monday, um, I had to pay cash also because their servers were down, and I was hangry, and I didn't have any cash, and so the woman bought it for me. And so I was thinking I would tell that story about me getting hangry, but then I thought, of another time where I landed a commercial airplane in the Caribbean in the middle of a category two hurricane. Um, so I, I thought maybe I'd talk about either one of those, but I'd let you kind of decide which one was more interesting. Uh, let's see. Someone's going to buy you lunch or you were a hero. Let's <laughs> go with, uh, the one of them is, is the narration of someone else being a hero for you because mm-hmm. no, low blood true. sugar is true. pretty good true. but let's 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 go with your your story your little story about an airplane okay so okay how, how does thought, that situation yeah, happen yeah, yeah we can go with that one again um <laughs> so i was a uh, commercial airline pilot down in the u.s virgin islands i flew for uh, seaborne airlines we flew twin otters on floats so basically um these these big propeller planes that we'd take off and land in in St. Thomas and the harbor and St. Croix. And, and These are the uh, ones that come into the water, right? They they land on yep. water? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Okay. And um, we would take turns who would fly which leg. So 
I was, we were flying back and forth to St. Thomas trying not to fall asleep because it's so hot and we were about 600 feet off the, off the ocean. And, um, oftentimes we'd kind of look over and, you know, see somebody sleeping next to us. And so it was my turn to fly to St. Thomas. We knew that there was a storm, a brewing coming. And yet the chief pilot made the decision that, nope, we're still open for business. Please fly. So we went to St. Thomas and, um, we we went to take off and it was like the storm was really really upon us and i don't for the life of me i can't remember the name i'd probably have to look in the in the log books i don't remember the name of the storm but it, it came in as a category one and um you know we'd been through category fives before not flying but we just recently had had a uh hurricane Winnie come through as a category five so one didn't seem all that intense What's and involved we, with a one, if you don't mind me interjecting real with quick? A hurricane, what, what is it? Yeah. It's just windy as hell. It's just, okay. it's really windy, a lot of gusts. The seed gets real choppy. Um, you, you're probably not going to lose a roof. You, it's, it's nothing like your garbage cans are going to fall over, stuff like that. Yeah. Not, not a real minor. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mere flesh wounds at that point. And so, um, it was my turn to sit in the right seat and, and be the, uh, the, co-pilot and I did not like the man I was flying with he he just was not a, a good dude um later he got arrested so I didn't have to worry about flying with him but I had a girlfriend who was sitting um this even though this was after 9-11 we still had an open cockpit because you know it was the Caribbean and we weren't really concerned about that kind of stuff and um so I have this girlfriend in the back and she's got her headset on so she can hear what is happening. And he takes off, we start flying and we hear on the radio, it's now a category two, you guys need to turn around. Well, we'd already passed the point of demarcation, which means we were closer to St. Croix than we were St. Thomas. And so we just kept going and I had just recently got out of flight training up in uh, Canada. And one of the coolest things that I, well, I, I shouldn't say it's cool, but I found it really interesting was, especially after 9-11, this was really top of mind. If the, if the pilot next to you seems to be out of sorts and, and doesn't seem like he's able to, or they are not able to continue, you need to say, hey, look, like I'm gonna take over, you just chill. I got it from here. And if they continue to not be cool and they don't respond, then you have to basically disable them. And we were told not, not their controls. Mm -mm. You have to disable the person. Okay. The pilot. Yeah. Okay. So you punch them, you grab the fire extinguisher, Jeez. you take, you disable the, okay. the pilot. And so, and so as we're flying, this guy starts going into just la la crazy land. I mean, he just starts showing signs of insanity. Now I'm maybe not always the most sane and rational person myself, but thank God I had my, my girlfriend at the time behind me, uh, kind of checking back at her and she's like, boy, this isn't good. You know, like this guy's not doing the right thing here. So I was like, okay, well, if she gives me the thumbs up, I'm going to just, you know. Oh, I thought you were going to say she had a piano wire in her in her purse and she was just gonna <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't that be cool um that would have made the headlines right so we're getting closer and closer and um and 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 man this, it was rough like the, it was really it was it was it was now a full-blown category two and we're coming in hurricane category two we're coming in and we have these little white um the basically PVC posts like pipe in the okay. ocean in the harbor that we call the goal, goal posts because our goal was to land in between them. So he's coming in and he's like, I can't see him, I can't see him, I can't see the goal posts, I can't. And he's starting to freak out. And I, we're, we come down and I can see him. I'm like, you know, out. Well, I can say his name now because the statute of limitations is up. I'm like, Alan. <laughs> You know, they're one o'clock, one o'clock, one o'clock, and he's just not getting it. You're too high, you're too high. Okay, now Alan, you're too low, too low, too high, go around, go around, go around. 
So he he decides instead of going around, he's just going to crash us into Christianstead, into the town. And he's like, we're just going in. He's like, I know there's a mattress shop there. We can just, it'll be a nice soft landing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I I give it just a quick look back. And now my girlfriend's just white as a sheet. She can't talk. She can't move. She's holding on. And mind you, we've got a full plane full of people. I mean, like we've got passengers on board that are screaming, crying, freaking out. We're bouncing. How many many people are we talking? Not a lot. I think there was maybe, but there was probably about 10 souls, maybe 10, 10 of us okay. total yeah, on sure. board. Um, maybe a few more, but I, but I can't recall. I'd have to check the log book. We're coming in. Alan's like, we're going in, we're going in. And I can see we're headed right into either a sailboat or the Harbor into, um, in, into the, uh, the pub. And I was like, okay, it's my plane. I've got the plane. And he's like, no, no, I got it. I was like, I'm going to grab the, can I swear? Can I say fuck? You do whatever you want. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to grab the fucking fire extinguisher and take you out, Alan. And I think that you know I will. And, and he kind of gave me a look and I was like, I, I, I am. I'm going to take you the fuck out. And so he goes, all right, fine, you're playing. And, and we go around and boy, I gave it everything we had. And we just barely missed the sailboat. We just barely missed town. And then as we're flying, there's a big ass mountain right behind Christianstead. And we're flying right into a house, like right into this house. And they were doing construction on it because of the Hurricane Lenny. And I could see the people's eyes and faces seeing that they were going to get (laughs) hit by a seaplane. And I don't know how, but we missed it. We come around, we come in, and... I put us down in between the goalposts, we float over and uh, we power in and uh, I I went to the chief pilot and I said, I will never fly with that man again. I said, you know, like he's not safe, yada, yada. Um, And about a week later, he got arrested for being drunk. Uh, He had been in the pub at two o'clock in the morning and seven o'clock he shows up to fly and he saw that the people who he was drinking with saw him on you know walking down the board ramp and they're like stumbling into the plane yeah like we know five hours ago you were just as drunk as we were and so they called the police they got him out two weeks later he was back on the job but at that point i i uh i shouldn't talk anymore about seaborne but yeah so that was kind of an interesting afternoon that's Um, um what's the first thing you do when you get off the plane like when you're in that situation, I mean, obviously your adrenaline is through the roof and I, and I, what, what happens? What do you do when you get right off of that plane? I, I think my first instinct was to take Alan out still. I, still. I still really <laughs> wanted to kind of hit him. Um, but my girlfriend was there and, and, and I think what actually I, I remember helping the passengers down the gangplank and they were so distraught. They were crying and there is, you know, you know, fairly larger St. Tomian women and Crucian women and men. And they were, they were visibly shaken. And so I think I, I, it was like, okay, I got to step up and, and deal with Alan later, but I got to help them. And, you know, then I, then my mind goes into business mode where I'm like, okay, liability here. Like we probably shouldn't have taken off in a category one and landed in a category two. So, you know, it was just like like PR and putting out fires at that point. And, oh, okay, yeah, just go talk to the customer service. They'll take care of you. And I, I kind of went into that mode. And then I, I got angry with Alan, um, but I, 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 I never did touch him. So, yeah. That's, yeah, because I could imagine that would not be, it's not a hug. No, <laughs> <laughs> that's not a hug. Was, oh, dude! A quick little tickle. Yeah, no. <laughs> you almost got us killed. Um, holy crap! Well, I, that is, that's definitely a story you can tell at any time, and you definitely have the best story in in the group, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, holy smokes! All right. Well, besides being a uh, flying superhero, you're like the Caribbean Sully, if you will. <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I, what, what, 
so besides that, what else makes you interesting? What what else, what are other things that you've done? Because I, you know, we posted up the the uh, title that you like, the International Man of Mystery, which is not far no. from the truth. You've done a lot of different things. What's some other things that people might know you for? Um, well, I was a, a dive master and dive instructor for quite a while in St. So John. you were in the air and uh, underwater. Yep. Yeah. Right. And, and, and St. Croix. Um, and I was also a, a boat captain for quite a while. And um, I, I just had a really, really good time um, underneath and on top and, and above the, the Caribbean. And then I, I really realized that, um, you know, I had read this theory that, and, and I don't know that it's just a theory, but to be nice, I'll just say theory that people who live in warmer environments go a little bit soft mentally and physically because it's it's lethargical you know to live in a warm environment you don't have to work hard you don't have to shovel snow and ice and so i i realized that like my life was really good and so it was time to move back up to the so how do you screw it up to make yourself stronger (laughs) yeah well so i moved to the icy northwest and Mm. and start shoveling snow and ice and and then i i um i ended up buying some property and some chainsaws and i learned how to cut down trees uh, like big ass trees to give me that same sort of excitement of near death um experience on a regular basis and so that's kind of where i am now is i I'm, i'm at the point where i don't ride my motorcycles anymore i don't fly jets fast anymore i used and then, and then after the airlines i moved up to florida and flew um private jet charter um but so yeah now i'm i'm, I'm cutting cutting big ass trees and that keeps me on my toes and keeps me mentally sharp and, and focused any any Pick- stories there the, uh, <laughs> like we've all watched those like logger shows on on whatever sh- channel but like that that is that is one of those things we never thought we'd ever think about as a society other than the people that go out and do the like lumberjack work yeah uh, what do you have any stories like did a tree go the wrong direction or probably the better stories are the trees yeah. didn't go in the right <laughs> yeah right yeah well i growing up in oregon i always like flipped off the lumberjacks and the in the log trucks and i always thought you know fuck you for taking all of our trees i had no idea <laughs> how a sustainable forest actually works i always right. thought the more trees the better right i mean if one is good five are even better than one well when i bought the property it, it was all completely overgrown with with juniper trees which can be fairly big i mean like like really quite large trees and um they suck up all the groundwater for the ponderosa. So the faster I cut the juniper, the better and healthier the ponderosa grow. And the pondos are much more beautiful trees. And so I I got on Craigslist and I found this felon who can't find a job anywhere else. And he says he loves cutting trees. He's six foot five and um, he comes out and I really like to cut the trees and he likes to limb them because he's, he's like this big jolly green giant. He just goes and it, they're limbed. And, and, and I found, we, we found he and I that I'm 10 times faster than he is. And the reason why is because he cuts it the way lumberjacks cut it. They cut this wedge and then they cut it from the back and it falls that direction. And you know where the tree is going to be. Well, I cut mine flat and then just hope that it doesn't hit me or that I can get out of the way before it starts to fall. So I used to smoke a lot of Blue Dream, which I don't recommend because it it makes you it made me crazy anyway. Um, but I'd smoke a lot of Blue Dream and I'd just go out and just just cut and cut and cut. And then he'd come along behind me and limb and limb and limb. And we had quite a few times where. Um, damn it if I almost just didn't get hit by a big ass juniper tree you know but um I didn't so that's good yeah I, I like that you knocked on wood because wood did not knock on you that's, <laughs> that's that, yeah <laughs> that's uh oh man um so was that part of the experience was just like cutting that tree and just being like let's see where it goes was it, if it comes it at me yeah I just got to move yeah. out of the way I got to be well, fast and not to sound you know out there or anything but as i get into the zone 
and I find this with a lot of things that I do. I kind of, I have a tendency to get my head down, get myself in the zone or the zone gets into me really is more of it. And I just fucking go. And with the trees, as the zone happens, as that zone time is happening, the trees will will talk to me and they'll say, or it could be the blue dream, but the trees talk to me and they say, you know, Hey, come cut me or Hey, cut that guy. Or, you know, this one's ready to go or that one's ready to go. Or, um, you know, they have this, these various things that they'll communicate to me. And so when I come up to the tree, I almost, it's, you know, not a hundred percent of the time, but I'd say 95% of the time I come up to just the right side to cut them on and I, I worked the saw around enough to where I have a fairly good idea as to where they're going to go. Um, sure. But there's been days where I've had like six or eight, and they're called widow makers because they'll hit you and kill you. But they fall, they're cut, and they hit another tree. And they're so big, you can't physically push them. So you have to either cut more trees, which gets really dangerous because now you got two trees falling somewhere or you got to hook a line up to it and pull it with the truck or a machine um and then you've got of course snow and mud and slippery conditions and roots and stumps and just shit everywhere that as you as i try to run away i i try not to trip over you know in the in the interim so holy crap that i mean that's that is an insane amount of danger and that's and just like, it. that's a Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a yeah. Wednesday at two o'clock. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, 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 um, I have a daughter now and so I don't take as much risks as I used to. I don't sure. ride my motorcycles. I don't fly jets. I don't, you know, I don't do stuff. Not that jets are dangerous, but I, I just, and I, and I don't even cut as many trees as I would like, but um, it is it is chainsaw season right now, and so I'm, I am out there cutting. Yeah. And it's That's, just such I, a good workout. Man, I just feel so good getting that physical, full-body, mental workout. And just, you know, I, I get so sore at the end of the day and just covered in grease and gasoline and just shit, you know, and I just fucking love it. Well, to me, that's way better than if you go to the gym because basically you're just going to oh, the yeah. gym and yeah. you're just like lifting some weights, but nothing gets done. You're actually, you get the result afterwards. You feel like you've accomplished something afterwards. I think that's a much better workout. And I can tell the difference between the <laughs> store-bought muscles and the real muscles. You know, living yeah. here in Tumalo, we got a lot of cowboys and cowgirls and uh, you can tell they're they're country strong. You know, it's like... You, you cut down a tree and then that just is the beginning of it. Now you got a bucket and, you know, chop it up and you got to pick it up and you got to throw it and move it and you're squatting and lifting and throwing. And then there's a rock in the way. You got to pick up the rock and throw it. And, um, and yeah, back in the old days, I used to go to the gym and it, it's, it's night. And, I mean, they're not even comparable almost. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they don't have the fear of death in them. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what that does for the physical body is when you experience that. Like, oh, you got to you yeah. got to be on your on your game. Like it's and it, and it is. It's a mental acuity as well as a physical acuity. That's impressive. Um, do, do you post up videos of you chopping down these trees? No, I try to stay away from the social media because when yeah, I go to too. social media, <laughs> it, it takes up a lot of my time. And then a lot of people start coming in and they start asking you know, for stuff or, you know, whatever. But um, I, I'm i going to be getting a skid steer, which is like a whole nother topic, but it's, it's a really cool little like micro mini machine that I can pick up trees and dig holes and move stuff around. And I'm thinking I probably will post a couple GoPros in out and around and then kind of start doing that because it's really rewarding to go up to a thicket of, forest that you can't see through and then you know four days later there's a park and a little park bench and a place to eat lunch and and there's like really you know like a beautiful little area and so i'd love to just even if for myself if nobody even watches i'd love to get right. video of that and and time lapse it you know yeah, absolutely. And well, and for someone like myself, I like the amount of times I've got an opportunity to go out and chop down a tree is pretty low. Like I don't have that many opportunities to do that. 
none mm-hmm. opportunities to do that. So it'd be kind of cool to be able to watch watch you do that. I I think that's awesome. Plus, uh, you know, I, <laughs> I there's got to be I some will. blooper reels there. Yeah, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I hope not, right? Yeah. I, I don't have one opportunity to have a blooper. <laughs> it was a great blooper, though. It was <laughs> the final blooper, is yeah, what it was. Yeah, I, um, I will. I, I will. I appreciate you saying that because it's been on my mind. But then I think, well, I don't know. Like, it's a lot of time, energy, and effort. But I think even just for my daughter, for in the future yeah. to see what you know, and and just for the historical reasons for the land, I'm really into the history of this plot of land in this area. And so, just to show the natural progression of, um, you know, how how it's progressing, I think would be would be really rad. Yeah, and where you live is Tumalo, and you Tumalo. actually Tumalo. I keep doing that, but Tumalo. I think I've been through there too, and I can't believe I can't say it right. You actually um, now you have a uh, a company that you just started, right? Tumalo uh, Group. A few years ago, yeah. A few years ago, yeah. yeah well, yeah. Okay. Yeah, Wait, tell t- tell everybody what that is because it's interesting. It it, yeah. it it seems like this amorphous thing, but I'm sure it's very focused when it needs to be. So why don't you, you probably do a better job of explaining it than I would. I like the word amorphous, though. That was a good one. Um, It's basically it's Travis in my Rolodex. And for anybody under 40 who doesn't know what a Rolodex is, it's my contact list and myself. Um, I tried after Hydroflask to retire and uh, just do absolutely fuck all except for travel the planet. And everywhere I would go, people would ask me, how do I do this? How did you do that? What happens now? How do I connect with? who I need to connect to. And so I started the Tumalo group just to help brands and businesses grow. I really enjoy, um, I get the same sort of rush cutting down a tree and starting a brand. I love to see a brand go from its infancy or, or the back of a napkin, as they say, all the way through to fruition and people buying a product. And so I help small startups and I help large, massive fortune X number, you know, fill in the blank companies, corporations source products. So I have a lot of factories that I've worked with for decades now and and I trust them. I trust them with IP. I trust them in our uh, intellectual property. I trust them with um, ideas and I trust them for prices and to keep their mouth shut and not knock us off. And, um, and then I also have graphic designers and engineers and, and people that are like just way, way, way smart. And we help put together a brand or a business. And so, and then I also do, I mean, as a part of it all, it's, it's business consulting, business mentoring, coaching, if you will. I don't have any kind of like buy now button or, a you know, three weeks to, you know, optimal business practices. I don't have any of that shit. It's just more real world. Let's just get your brand up there. So I, so a couple years ago, I tried to start a, a company, a brand, and I could have used your advice so badly because I did. I went and paid for marketers that, that, that was their big focus was you got to have a time frame, time stamp on it and blah, blah, blah. No, it's really about building building value within that brand and, and making it more real. And I, I am 100% with you on that. Yeah, and you have a, yeah. you have experience with building a, a pretty decent brand. Like you, you mentioned it, like you invented the Hydro Flask, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah that was me. So, <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, uh, I've definitely spent hundreds of dollars on those, but, um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think you actually welcome. bought the fish aquarium right here. Yeah, <laughs> it looks that like was... that. Definitely looks like a Christmas from a couple of years ago. So, um, when you talk about stealing IP, that is the bit one of the biggest things when you're doing manufacturing. I'm I'm just going to go down this path because I'm interested in it. How do you find places that that you can trust for for IP? Because honestly, like we see knock off everything like within days of something getting announced, there is a knockoff, including Hydroflask. So how did you, how did you build those relationships so that people wouldn't steal that? <laughs> Cause 
Well, yeah, there's a lot. And can you that. show the bottle that you just bought? Because well, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. so crazy. I won't show the logo, but yeah. It's no, 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 thousand. don't show the logo, but look at that thing. It's a monster. <laughs> Isn't that something? My theory yeah, it's is, got a serious handle. A, yeah, well, and I'm glad, too, and it feels nice. It's a nice material, and it feels stout, and I'm going to get ripped drinking it because it's so damn heavy, but, well, it's eight and a half pounds or eight pounds for fresh water i think eight and a half for uh, salt and this is fresh obviously um and, and then the metal on top of that it, my theory is is if i have a gallon next to me throughout the day i'm going to drink a lot more than just i try to drink half of my body weight in ounces every day um so i'm a between 188 and 200 so i say about 100 ounces and so i figure if i have a gallon i may drink at least hopefully my 100 ounces and so this is kind of my my theory for that. I love it. Um, yeah. So as far as the knockoffs go, you know, with Hydro Flask, we were very fortunate that we were the first doing double wall vacuum insulated water bottles. It just wasn't happening. And then um, I had a, a fantastic, awesome friend of mine who was also just happened to be a, um, a patent attorney named Michelle in Salem, Michelle Valchin. And... Um, Vlatch Ng, actually. She just got married. It was Michelle Ng. I just call her Michelle Ng. But um, she's now a hyphen. But anyway, Michelle did a great job of getting us design patents. And those, the, the design patents gave us the, um, the right to advertise patented and patent pending. And so that gave us, a, I feel that gave us about a three to six month buffer where the honest stayed honest and the dishonest and not dishonest, just the opportunists really opportunists, yeah, that's the good. opportunists were like, Oh, okay, well, wait a second. Let's check into those patents. And they were still kind of, you know, kind of up in the air and it's still kind of vapor at that time. But that gave us just enough lead time to go out and, and, and sort of, you know, do our magic as it were. And, um, and then our first knockoff came from the guy who was um, screen printing for us. And he was literally two doors down, three doors down in the same little strip mall complex. And, um, and he knocked us off. And so it's not always just, you know, the foreign countries that are maliciously knocking people off. In fact, a lot of times it's Americans finding other factories in other countries to knock you off. It's not just... You know, oh, that country, damn it, they knock everybody off. Nope, that's not actually true. A lot of times it's those damn Americans going to those damn factories, then knocking you off, you know? And that's the part that I didn't realize. And I think a lot of people don't really know or talk about much is that it's it's the asshole neighbor who's going to steal your idea and, not, sure. and then knock you off, not necessarily the asshole on the far side of the world. But yeah, that happens I, too, though, of course, yeah. Sure, absolutely, but that's that's really interesting because I think everybody looks at like, oh, you have a factory, you're working with a factory in China, they're the ones that are stealing it, but not necessarily because it's it's literally your graphic designer was like, oh, I see an opportunity here, I can put a different wrapper on this thing and call it something Green else, print, and all of a yeah. sudden, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's wow. what he did, yeah. you know, and he was hiding behind, you know, this dogmatic religion that he was in, and him and his father said that they were upstanding citizens because of this and that and the other. And, and then they were, you know, moonlighting as a, as a bottle company. And he knocked us off like, like fair dinkum. Like he cut the bottle open, cut it in half, sent it off and said, make me exactly that. And they made exactly that. And that was what we had patents for. So um, he's now since morphed into larger contraptions and, um, you know, karma has, has, uh, done what it will with him. Oh my God. That's terrible. You almost want to take a fire hydrant to his head or a fire <laughs> extinguisher to his head. <laughs> but you know, what's funny is I saw him at a coffee shop. Um, I saw him at a coffee shop probably about four or five years ago, six years ago now. And, um, I was ordering my coffee and I kind of look over and he's the guy's such an asshole. He was sitting at a four top. It's a busy coffee shop and he's on his computer and he's got three open seats around him when there's groups of people everywhere trying to get a four top and he's taking up the full, full four top. So of course I get my 
lot, lavender latte and I sit down right next to him and I, and I just gradually start scooting over closer and closer to him until finally my arm was touching him and uh, he got up and he bolted and then I got <laughs> up and let a, I let a four top sit down. A four. <laughs> uh, always the hero. That's all. That's you. You're always the hero, Travis. <laughs> Looking at um, those four tops. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. So you, at some point you said, fuck it, I'm out of Hydro Flask for whatever reason. Uh, you built a very successful brand. Like that's, that's incredible. And you decide I'm taking off. You're just going to go travel. How many countries did you actually get to get into? Did you keep counting? I, no, I haven't. I need to. Um, there's, and the reason why I kind of want to is there's a, and I don't know the name of it, but I think it's like a centurion club, not for hundred year old pluses, but for a hundred country plus people. And so I really need to count and um, see if I can get a free T-shirt from, or you know, I'm sure I have to pay a hundred bucks or whatever. But it, <laughs> I want to see if I can get a, a free shirt from this this um, people who've been to over a hundred countries club membership thing. Um, but but it, I kind of cheated because when I was a pilot and I was living in the Caribbean, I would fly to all these different islands that were like right there or just you know just over the. I say over the horizon, we don't actually live on a round ball, but just just past that island is another island, and those are two countries. So I had to hit three new countries in, in three days. Um, it's kind of like Europe. You go to Europe, my, my first right. wife was British, and we could go Ryan Air back in the day for like 15 quid. We could be in another country. We could rent a car and be in seven countries in the afternoon. And, and, and be home and, and have put 10 countries under our belts. So, you know, Europe and the Caribbean, I kind of I kind of cheated a little bit, but um, hey, man, the numbers count. Plus, <laughs> they do. They, I mean, <laughs> it's all an off to my belt, I guess. But yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I love to travel. Oh, that's cool. That's very cool. What's a what's a place that uh, you would suggest someone go, and what's a place you would not suggest somebody go? Well, I. <laughs> That's a good question. I suggest people go to Africa, any country thereof, and go check it out. Like, I think the Americans, there's a lot of snowflakes. There's a, and I just love that term because we've got snow on the ground. There's a lot of just soft ass people who just don't know what the real world's like. You go to Africa. I was in Kenya. I went to Nairobi. I was in the you know million man slum. And there's way more than a million people there. And that just put my entire life into perspective. I've been shot at. I've had knives pulled. I've been in all kinds of crazy scenarios. But physically being inside in the slum, um, it, it really hit. I suggest people go do that kind of stuff. Just sure. if you want a real world experience, go to the Million Man Slum in Nairobi. That shit will wake you up quick. That That's a sobering thing. Um, I suggest people do not go to Iceland. It's the most beautiful country ever. And I don't want anybody that get to go there because eventually I may want to retire there again. Sure. So I, I suggest do not go to Iceland. Please mm -hmm. go to Nairobi. And... Um, those would be my two. Okay. All right. Good. Um, I, I do have to make this comment real quick. Um, I your facial hair is amazing. Like I I <laughs> wish I you got that good Northwest like full beard thing going on. Um, I so as far as that goes, like that's really on fleek. Now, do you do all the other Portland things where you have lots and lots of tattoos? Is that a thing that you also do? <laughs> I am covered, yeah. <laughs> yeah, are you? Okay. Yeah, I, I would say probably, you know, I don't know a percentage, 70 to 80%, of, well, 70% of my body probably, yeah. Really? Not, not on not, your not, face, not, though, and not uh, on your nope, arms? I, no, nope. I, I've kept it above my um, T-shirt lines. Okay. Um, but, yeah, I've got, yeah, you know, and I, I, I think – they, they just sort of come to me and it's like, I'm going to get a tattoo of this or that or the other. And, and then I, I, I think about it for, I ruminate on it for months and months. And then if it's still with me, then I'll do it. Others, it, I'll be in a foreign land and, oh, you guys have a tattoo parlor. Let's go check it out. And next thing I know, I'm there for four hours getting tattooed and, um, 
I, I point to my ribs. I was in China, and the only tattoos I'd ever seen was with the mafia because that was all that there was. It was mafia tattoos, and and if you saw tattoos, you knew you were looking at a badass motherfucker, right? Like right, you don't right, fuck right. With a badass tattoo. <laughs> And so I would always go fuck with the guy with the tattoo. Like we'd be in a bar and I'd see guys with tattoos and I'd, you know, go show them my tattoos and I'd see theirs. And the people I'd with would just be like, fuck, like we don't want to hang out with Travis anymore because he just hangs out with the mafia. Um, but then they kind of opened it up to the general public. And um, yeah, my first tattoo I got in China, I, 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 um, I asked, I was like, can I see your autoclave where you sterilize the needles? And he's like, no, we don't have one. We don't, we don't clean the needles. And I was like, okay, obviously my translators have done a, a terrible job here. Let me, you know, like draw a picture and see. He's like, no, no, we don't, we don't do that. Yuck. Why would we clean the needles? And then I realized, oh, it's because you use a fresh needle every single time. Okay, oh, I'm good. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're a little bit on edge there for a second. You're like, maybe we need to go oh, someplace else. I don't want to offend yeah, maybe, them, but. <laughs> yeah, they wanted to go see the newest Marvel comic movie at the cinema. And I was like, yeah, we could do that or we could get a tattoo. But then I was like, well, maybe the Marvel movie would be better and safer. But I ended up getting a tattoo instead. Yeah. And you got a tattoo of? Um, well, I fuck if I know what it actually says, right? But um, <laughs> I, but I asked him. I was like, "Look at me. Look at my tattoos. What do you think?" And he quick. I mean, he was just Johnny on the spot. Quick, it came to him. It basically says, "Be content with what you have, but always strive for more." And then he put my um, my name in China is Huga. I have a, a like official name, and so he put my Huga stamp you know my little um you know when you dip it in the ink and you right stamp the, it ink, the wax and do the whole thing mm -hmm. game of thrones yeah, style yeah yeah. And, yeah exactly so he put that in red and then the be content with what you have but always strive for additional or more uh in in just the traditional black ink yeah Oh, that's cool um do you go for more like that's kind of like a an inspirational like meaningful tattoo mm -hmm. do you go for mm -hmm. is that mainly what you go for or do you go for do you do wacky stuff too i do wacky stuff too um when i traveled throughout the south pacific i kind of collected just little scraps of paper this was before cell phones and, and photographs on our cameras on our phone and stuff but i, I collected collected little scraps of paper of tattoos and ideas and drawings and things and then i would come home and then get them here because I don't, I haven't really wanted to spend most of my holiday or, you know, I'm only in a place for two or three weeks and I don't want to spend three or four days in a tattoo parlor where, you know, I may not feel good or well afterwards and things. And so I, I, I brought those a lot of, a lot of my tattoos I brought home with me to get done here. Um, but um, yeah, like I've got a Lorax flying on my shoulder because, you know, the Lorax is all about protecting the trees and sure. if not him, who? Um, <laughs> one that um, my tat, I've got a fairly good buddy, Chris Callister here at Iron Elephant Tattoo and Ben, and he's done the majority. He did all of my back and my ribs. Um, he's done a lot of a lot of my tattoos, a lot of my work. Um, but one of the, one of his favorite ones is, um, I've got a little UFO with the H guy, the hydro flask guy parachuting out of it, uh, okay. basically saying, fuck it, I'm out. <laughs> and so I've got that. That's kind of one of the funnier ones, I guess. That's yeah. good. That's good. I like that. I like it. If you're going to have like, um, a bunch of tattoos, definitely have some, have a narrative somewhere, right? Like that, that I think that's really cool is if you can have like different stories with different tattoos. I got this one here. I got the, that one there. I love, I love that. I think that's really great. It, um, I feel that when they find the body, they'll be able to look at it and go, who the fuck is this guy? Well, he's got this one and this one and this one. He's obviously lived here and he's done this and he's done that. And, um, I, I don't know of anybody who's got the H guy tattoo. So that must be the hydro flask guy. I don't know. Right. But that, they'll be able to identify it, the body easier. Yeah. It's like, it's like, it's guess. body hieroglyphics, right? So like, it if, is, it that's, that's yeah. exactly what it turns out to be. It is. And, and there are times where I'll be like at a hotel where there's like these really cool mirrors and, you know, like, 
and I'll, I'll just kind of catch a glimpse of myself in the mirror and go, oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've got that one because I did this back then. And I forget that I forget that I even have tattoos. Like I see people with tattoos. I'm like, huh, you're a tattooed person. I <laughs> gotcha. Um, but when I see my own, it's like it, it brings back a memory. It conjures right. up past events and past lives. And so it, it does work like that. I don't have to have as good of memory if I have a good tattoo for it. It's a good, I mean, it's a, I, that is the best reason to have tattoos. Uh, and they can look cool. That that part too is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> um, well, this has been delightful. Uh, Travis, uh, we do need to record a sketch though. So. Travis, you almost have me convinced to go get a tattoo. Um, while I'm considering this huge life change, do you mind telling everybody about the Tumalo Group? Why they should visit the Tumalo Group? Yeah. I, I'm... I don't know that people should visit the Tumblr group. It's not a great website. We're not really doing anything of any massive interest over there. I think that if people want to reach out to me, they can, but I don't want to force them to. It's I don't have any buy now button or anything, but it is tumblogroup.com, T-U-M-A-L-O-G-R-O-U-P.com. And I'm also on LinkedIn, Travis Rossback. I, I don't know how to do LinkedIn coding, but it's T R A V I S R O S B A C H on that LinkedIn thing. Awesome. Well, it'll be in the show notes. Sometimes people like to reach out. So maybe someone's yeah, coming up with a brand totally. and needs your help. Yeah, I like it. Yeah. And I will, it, I have a big project I'm, I'm getting close to and I will let you know, um, cause I'd love to come back. Now I present our sketch, the peaceful sounds of nature in three. Two. I just absolutely love smoking my blue dream outside, clear blue sky, the trees, the rocks, the twigs, the stumps. Just love it. I love the dirt. I love the snow. I love the ice. Whatever it might be. I'm just loving going out, smoking my blue dream, and cutting my junipers. what those dirty junipers do to our land. I can tell, and that's why part of my mission in life is to take out as many damn junipers as I possibly can eradicate as quickly as I can. That's cool. Can you make sure you get that one over there next to the creek? You mean the, the, the big one that has got the chipmunk in it? That one? Yeah, that one. Can you make sure you get that one next? And make it uh, slow and painful? I had, uh, that sounds a bit kind of dark and sinister. Yes, down with the junipers. Get them all. I should get a t-shirt made with down with the junipers. That'd be cool. People would buy it. I could sell down with the juniper t-shirts. Especially that juniper tree. You have to get that juniper tree. But if I get that one, I'm going to have to get the one next to it also. Oh, yeah. That one's also really bad. The, the big one. The, but what about the chipmunk? <laughs> Collateral damage, but you need to make sure you get that juniper tree. All is fair in love and war, I guess. And I could say that this is an all-out assault and war against the juniper. Fuck that chipmunk. <laughs> Let's go. Fuck that chipmunk. Also, fuck that juniper tree. Fuck them. Fuck them both. I'm going to take them. I'm going to take that juniper and the other three junipers around it. If you love it so much... Why do you cut us in half? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I was told that the Junipers were not friends of the Ponderosas and that it was okay to cut you guys down. The Ponderosas are racist. <laughs> Thank you for joining us for Sketch Comedy Podcast Show. We hope you enjoyed listening or watching as much as we enjoyed making it. And now for a little bit of legalese. 
Sketch Comedy Podcast Show is protected under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Derivative 4.0 International License. And if you can say that five times really fast, you win! Um, also, copyright 2023, Stuart Rice. Um, it really, the reason for that is I, if you want to reproduce anything from the show, the sketch, or any part of the conversation, I would like you to reach out to me so I can get you a good copy of it. Thank you so much, and until next time, go and improvise a comedy adventure of your own. Maybe try not to get into a plane that's going to crash, though. Yeah, I, I saw you. That was my wife, you motherfucker. Yeah. Like... <laughs> <laughs> So do I'm any of those three paper cut in the next life? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do any of those three sound really good? I like them all. Yeah. I can that imagine like one additional shingle flying off and somebody's like, okay, yep. There's the 417th shingle. It's not a category five. Yeah. Um, I can also imagine his name was arrowhead Rob because he went to prison for having arrowheads amongst other things. And, um, yeah, that's a good one. Um, I, I really appreciate the, the talking with the trees, though. I think that sounds. Yeah, really I think it, <laughs> I think that one will turn out really, really good. Um, all right, well, let's do that one then. So this would just be like you going out. Wait a second, he got arrested for owning arrowheads. Well, that was the story that I originally heard. Yeah, was that every. I, I don't know a number, maybe five years, I think it is, the Native American tribes go to the government and say, hey, you guys owe us money, pay up. And the government goes, we don't have money for you. We're not paying you any money. They say, and they say, go get the money or else. And so the government goes out and they're like, okay, well, let's just arrest a bunch of people for taking um, artifacts from public lands. And so they go out and they arrest a bunch of people what happens when you get arrested? Well, court fees and, you know, the whole system starts propagating money and then they, they make the money. They go to the tribes and they go here. Now shut the fuck up. Fuck off for five years. Five years later, they come back. Give us our money. You said you'd give us. They say we don't have it. And then the whole thing starts again. Holy I had shit. No Is that real? Yeah. I had no idea that was taking place. I had. Why isn't no anybody clue. making a documentary about that? That is. And then what's really crazy is um, Arrowhead Rob, I call him because his name's Rob and he, he, you know, has arrowheads. He had the largest arrowhead collection in like the world and they took it from him and they put it on display at the, instead of giving it back to the tribe, they gave it to the federal courthouse in Eugene, Oregon, which I guess is where it is today on display. So yeah, I don't want any black SUVs following me for this, but that's the way it goes. Yeah. Holy shit, that's... Mm. Huh. Mm. Well, mm -hmm. that took a dark turn. Um, 